This is John Kola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today I have another exciting episode for you. And once again, I'm on a field trip. I love field trips. I always learn so much when I'm on field trips. And once again, I'm in suburbia, as you guys can see. Standard residential area here in Houston, Texas. And while I'm here today is to share with you guys a really cool garden. Now, it's not just a backyard garden that I'm going to show you guys today. It's also a front yard garden. And uh, let me go ahead and pan over and show you guys what we're looking at here. So you can see just down the block, everybody has a lawn. I don't encourage you guys to grow a lawn. I think it's an incredible waste of space. I mean, if you had kids and kids were playing on the lawn, that'd be one thing. But most people don't ever use their lawn. It's an incredible waste of resources. The water, the fertilizer, the pesticides, herbicides, unneeded when you can be growing something like I'm going to show you guys today. So let's check it out. So here's the one I'm going to show you guys today. You guys just saw one corner with uh, a lawn and here's the place that I'm going to show you guys today. It's a residential food forest, permaculture style food forest. I mean, I just spent maybe like an hour or so with the gardener here that's doing this who actually actually wrote a book on gardening, has been gardening in this location since like the 80s. I mean, this is one highly developed systematized and methodized food forest and he has a solution for everything one of the amazing things I want to point out is that he hasn't sprayed any pesticides and yes we are in Texas here hot humid Texas he hasn't sprayed any pesticides to repel any pests since the 80s John Howard stink bugs not eating his stuff well you might learn that a little bit later on in this video but you know, there's ways to do these things if you do it properly and appropriately. And this guy has an answer for everything because I've asked him lots of questions and I'm quite impressed with his answers. So in any case, without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, show you guys his uh, permaculture suburban household here and uh, show you guys what some of the things he's growing. I mean, he has over 130 varieties of different fruit trees as well as like raised bed edible vegetable gardens. And he's like stacking functions and has multiple uses for many different things. So I guess first, we'll take you and show you guys around the periphery of the garden. Some of the ways you might want to use the area around your property to grow food and maybe even protect your property. All right, so now we're standing on the property and walking up to its front door. You're gonna notice a few things. Number one, looks like a jungle in here and he has all different kind of plants planted around the border of his house. Uh, you could have like natives to attract their butterflies. There's a beautiful native Texas plant that has amazing flowers that smell good that's attracting butterflies by the droves actually uh, somebody walking their dog stopped and like wow all those butterflies are really cool or uh, you know he has edible fruit trees on some edges and then up uh, this edge he actually has something that he showed me first when I got here and he has a whole bunch of different roses and uh, a cactus and he said like you know what function this serves and I'm just like thinking well maybe they're edible I mean the cactus produces edible fruit actually he said this is a really delicious edible fruit the uh, cactus produces and then uh, over here they have the roses I'm like oh roses they're edible you can eat the roses and the, the leaves and stuff and uh, they're not the best tasting to eat rose leaves but they're edible you know it's a famine food or something so I'm like yeah okay yeah they're they're edible and he's like nope he's like they all got thorns because they protect my grapefruit tree I'm like what people come up and pick a grapefruit tree he's like well they ain't gonna do it now <laughs> so you know you can actually have multiple functions of crops that you're growing and he's thought like many different ways to use crops uh, or plants in a in a purposeful way to grow food here and so i like that a lot i've learned a lot about this actually he's a permaculture teacher and uh, teaches classes locally if you do live in houston uh, i recommend you actually uh, check him out and learn from this man he knows a lot about gardening so in any case let's actually head to the uh, backyard and show you guys some of the cool more interesting uh, fruit trees and vegetables and that he's growing but more specifically how he's doing it so that you can do it too wherever you live so the specifics of what I'm showing you guys today is actually uh, particular to Houston and the surrounding area and similar climates but you know concepts that you'll be learning in this video could be used pretty much wherever you live so anyways, uh, let's go back and uh, give you guys the grand tour. All right, so now we're actually, uh, what we're looking at is we're behind the grapefruit tree and there's like little pathways. And as you guys will notice, I mean, this is like a heavily wooded area and, you know, growing a lot of these things outside the house. I mean, you really, really can't see the street from the house. So it looks like you're literally in the middle of the woods, even though you're in a nice suburb. I mean, 
Also, it you know, dampens the noise from the streets. And the other thing is that this provides tons of food. As you guys could see, I mean, there's like literally fruit trees, sometimes every five feet. And I asked him, like, so do you have a specific width or how far apart do you plant your fruit trees? Like, well, he's like, you know, if you like a fruit tree and they're planted too close and you don't like another one, just cut the other one down later. But on average, it looks like, you know, five to six feet apart, you know, is some of the fruit trees. I mean, here's two trees and there's just a lot of different kinds of fruit trees represented here. I mean, this is a nice fig tree here. He has actually lots of different citrus and even tropical. So he has guavas on a protected side of the house, uh, jabaticaba fruit, uh, lychee fruit, uh, so many different rare varieties. I mean, I think Houston, of all the places I've ever visited, it's one of the best places to grow, you know, not only subtropicals and some tropicals, but are also northern climate fruits. So he has some really well-producing apples and whatnot. Actually, here's a loquat. This is actually one of my favorite uh, fruits and uh, trees to grow. Evergreen, I like it a lot. And this area pretty much has like a understory plants, so plants on the bottom is the ground cover, and then you know the fruit trees going up top. One of the cool things he's doing here is uh, his stakes. When he needs tall stakes, he basically just gets the standard like uh, inexpensive T posts, uh, not the heavy duty ones that are kind of like have like a, a U groove on them, as you guys could see. And what he does, and I just started actually recently doing this. He actually uses just a bolt, and he bolts it together. And then, uh, as you guys can see now, it makes it like twice as tall. So these are like 12 foot tall. So whether he needs to like make four of them and then put like mosquito netting to like have a big cage over a tree, or whether he's stringing a trellis up, this is definitely a really good and a solid way to get a pretty good uh, solid support to uh, you know uh, trellis things up uh, if they get really heavy. Here's a citrus tree that is loaded. Looks like uh, some kind of tangerine uh, tree to me. Super amazing. He has lots of citrus here. And uh, some real cold tolerant citrus that we might also look at, at a little bit. Another cool thing is that he collects all his rainwater. So he has over 4,000 gallons um, of storage uh, potential here. With the big cisterns here, it catches all the water off his roof so he doesn't have to use city water to water his garden. I recommend using, you know, rainwater whenever possible because it's not, you know, uh, doesn't have added chemicals like chlorine and some places fluorinate and it's what would water the plants naturally. So in this way you're using a resource that's free, you know, especially when it's hurricane season here. I mean, this is rain storage or rain catchment, you know, on a big scale and he was doing it before it got really popular. I mean, it just, it feels so natural here with just all these trees. You wouldn't know you were in the middle of a subdivision here in Houston. I mean, there's just fruit trees and fruit trees abound, like all so close, planted together. Oh, and here's the vegetable garden. So as you guys can see, he's doing raised bed edible vegetable gardens. So I think this is a really well-designed system with, you know, the mostly fruit trees and shrubs and other crops uh, including natives in the front yard and in the backyard they got a number of maybe eight or so raised beds and actually they are quite long they run the pretty much the distance from you know the backyard to the back fence with some uh, fruit trees in the back as well and they got it really well planted out i guess what i want to do next actually uh, maybe sit down and talk with you about some of the different uh, crops he's growing here that are doing well at this t time uh, here in Houston, it's uh, November now, and they're planting the winter crops. So as you guys can see, they got the uh, daikon radishes. I saw arugula. Here's some collard greens, and uh, there's some nice big uh, Georgia collards there. Look at the size of those leaves. One of the cool things is he is building the soil. So he grows in a natural, organic methods, and is really key on building the soil, as am I. And uh, these leaves are gigantic and huge. I mean, you could use these leaves instead of like buying tortillas. You could use it to wrap, you know, uh, different things in and eat it. And use it instead of bread, actually. I mean, it's free. You got to buy bread. And here you got tons of collard leaves you could just pick and eat from the backyard. Over on this side, we got a bunch of basil. Looks like it's doing really well. Over here, they're uh, right in the middle of harvesting 
uh, their sweet potatoes, a standard sweet potato vine, which is actually grown for the sweet potatoes that you guys could see in there. Uh, here in the original, in the middle of the uh, raised bed, looks like they got a big, a uh, huge uh, papaya tree coming up, and uh, here's some really cool okra. This is like an heirloom okra. I mean, this stuff is towering at like 10 feet. He actually gave me some of the seeds that are available at Baker Creek. He said. And uh, these ones are actually get like six inches long and they're still tender. So I like that a lot. So now we're sitting on his little raised bed garden. As I had mentioned, he has like eight different raised beds here, growing a variety of different crops. Here his, are his uh, winter crops. One of the things I like is that he's growing a diversity. He's not just growing like, you know, Georgia collards. You got Georgia collards, but he got all kinds of different collards and kale and brassica plants and Brussels sprouts and all kinds of cool stuff. So I want to encourage you guys to grow a diversity. Now the reason why he's growing in raised beds is because here in Houston they got clay soil. Clay soil is actually great if you treat it properly, but yeah, it has a lot of nutrition in it, but it's poor draining. So he had to actually grow above the clay soil. So he actually built raised beds and got some compost and topsoil and is mainly grown in a mixture like that with a local source of uh, the soil. And he's using these uh, bricks the blocks he's using the blocks he found the blocks to be the most efficient way to grow in the raised beds i mean he used wood and pressure treated wood before he found out it was really bad because it does leach and so now he uses the blocks and while it might be an investment to buy the blocks once once they're here they're pretty much not going to go anywhere and you're going to have a garden forever and also he likes that the blocks could maybe uh, harbor beetles and other you know beneficial insects and gives them a nice home also they could act as a heat sink so for the winter time they'll actually absorb the sun stay a bit warmer and the beds off the ground are going to heat up uh, you know uh, better than being in the ground so I definitely like the raised beds a lot and he's really all for the using the concrete blocks as a raised bed I mean these have been here for and I don't even know how many years now so one of my favorite plants that he's growing that I learned about on this trip actually are these guys right here it's actually called green glaze collard like the glazed donuts you used to eat when you're a kid <laughs> these are much healthier I don't recommend glazed donuts but I recommend the gl green glazed collard they're available from southern exposure seeds and uh, these collards actually have a nice sheen or shine to them unlike you know the standard collard greens that are kind of have that dull finish it's like the variety of dinosaur kale that I showed once called shiny diny it's actually shiny and he said this doesn't get the caterpillar damage that the standard you know ca uh, collard greens do I mean that's one of the tip grow varieties of plants that bugs simply aren't going to eat and he said also these taste delicious maybe I'm gonna sneak a little bite of one of these wow that's a really good flavor on a collard leaf I love it they start to sweeten up you know in the colder months Next, let's take a look at something coming out of one of the other raised beds looks like bananas don't go bananas grow some bananas so check it out here and coming out of one of the raised beds he has a nice huge banana plant and these are not banana trees although many people call them banana trees and actually these bananas are called ice cream bananas yes that's because they taste like ice cream these are a very good variety of bananas and you may be surprised you know you can grow bananas in more than just the tropics here in Houston uh, they will do fine and as they will in many other places there are bananas that will even produce you know into zone eight uh, you know certain varieties are more cold tolerant than others down below here they just uh, had planted some carrots they do uh, rotation gardening so every season they rotate crops and the different raised beds looks like they have a uh, drip tape to automatically water their vegetable garden uh, all the fruit trees are watered as needed and just with the rain they're a lot less maintenance than growing the vegetables as you guys can see here uh, we're at the uh, fence boundary here and I always encourage you guys to grow up your fence boundary make the best use of your space so what he's growing up the fence boundary is a really cool he's making the best use of the space because not only is he growing down on the bottom as a ground cover so instead of using mulch he's actually growing a living mulch is what I recommend and actually this is cool this is something I'm actually gonna be able to pick up today uh, these guys here are actually uh, called sweet potato spinach so this is a special variety of sweet potatoes actually not grown for the tuberous roots 
um, because they don't really produce any, but it's grown for the leaves. These are nice, edible, delicious uh, leaves that can be harvested. Uh, this plant, provided it doesn't you know, get too cold, will live year round. If it does get cold, it might, the top growth might die back, but then it'll come back next year. Um, otherwise, you might want to pull some up and put it in a safe place in a greenhouse or indoors and overwinter it and then put it out next uh, spring. So that's on the bottom story. So next, above the sweet potato spinach, he has uh, blackberries growing. And then even above the blackberries, you guys can see it goes up and up and up and up and up. And there it is. It's, it's the muscadine. So he has muscadines, blackberries, followed by the spinach. So this way he makes the best use of the space. So as you guys can see, he's using once again the uh, intertwined T-post. That's a strong, inexpensive way to uh, trellis things up uh, and keep them off the ground to make maximum use of your airspace. So just wandering in the back here, you know, once again, we got like fig trees coming out the ground here and we got all these different kind of fruit trees. I mean, he gave me a tour of all these and named off many of the different varieties that I don't, you know, remember, but there's a lot of different rare and unique citrus. Uh, one of the cool things, if you live in Houston in January, they have a massive, huge uh, fruit tree sale. Actually, it's in a college stadium football stadium it fills it up they sell lots of fruit trees that are going to do excellent in the Houston area so if you live in Houston you definitely want to get to this fruit tree sale which we'll talk about at the end of uh, this video today I'm just wandering through the backyard I mean once again this is very densely planted and you know don't just think oh I could only plant a fruit tree every 12 feet I mean some of these are spaced like five six feet apart I mean super close together and I mean he focuses on keeping some of these guys trimmed back so that he could grow you know more of them and sometimes he just like lets certain ones just overpower the other ones maybe some are more important to him than others some of them need more sun some actually might kind of live in the shade and still kind of produce all right of course as any gardener should have a compost pile so he just actually stuck his compost pile just uh you know in the garden there there's a whole pile of uh you know uh decomposing wood which can add good organic matter to your garden Let's see going through here here's more of the uh, spinach sweet potato vine on the bottom looking really healthy as a ground cover once again more citrus I mean this is Texas man this citrus country up oh, here's one of my favorite fruit trees right here that I'm growing it does excessively well in uh, Northern California for me. It's the Fahoa and actually I was in Texas and last March I had a few Fahoas grown in Texas and I can't say they're as good as the ones I'm growing But uh, definitely really good Fahoas Here's another raised bed with a lot more of the Sweet potato spinach, you know really easy crop that's just gonna vine out and keep growing and producing edible leaves for you uh, It's a quite rare crop. I actually never heard of this one before so I'm Happy today I'll actually be able to get some uh, cuttings or something to kind of get this growing for myself. In the back here we have uh, a banana. So he was telling me this banana is hardy to like 10 degrees or something like that. So even if you live in places you could grow bananas. The fruit may not taste the best but at least the plant is hardy. So that's definitely good to know. And uh, once again we're on the other fence boundary. And you can see the street. If you look hard, you can see the street, but it's pretty much covered in all different kinds of uh, greenery. Actually, oh, this is a really cool tree here. You guys can see this, uh, this is a special lemon variety, and it's uh, crossed with a wild uh, orange and a lemon. So these are like super hardy trees down to like, I don't even know, 10 degrees or something. You can still grow lemons that he gave me once. I'm going to get to try it. Hopefully it has a good flavor, but I really like the leaves on here. They're kind of like uh, rounderish leaves for a lemon. Um, there's another cool plant I like a lot. It's actually called turmeric. So if you live in Houston, you definitely want to grow some turmeric. It's a very, bold, very valuable root crop, probably my number one favorite root crop for like uh, antioxidant value and health uh, benefit. The turmeric there needs a long season to grow. Another place to grow it well is Hawaii or maybe South Florida. Short season uh, maybe wouldn't do so well. Needs a nice long season. 
Looks like the end of his peppers over in these uh, raised beds here. Some uh, eggplants that are still producing. Here's the end of his uh, his squash here growing, and he's been actually uh, saving seed and selecting his squash for a variety that is insect resistant and does well here in the Houston area. So one of the things I would totally grow if I lived here in Houston were a bunch of avocado trees. I mean, the avocados are a fruit that I love. They're a fatty fruit, high in calories compared to other fruits, and they're gonna do really well here. Uh, right here, he has like three different varieties of cold hardy avocados. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the different cold hardy avocados, be sure to check my past videos. I did a really good episode talking more about cold hardy avocados in the past, where you could buy them, and uh, you know, the different types. I definitely love the avocado, and it's great to see he's growing some cold hardy ones here in the backyard. So one of the coolest things I learned today was to basically uh, grow blackberries up T-posts, and he used the double high uh, T-posts that I showed earlier to grow the blackberries up, and then he also grows the, uh, some grapes up over the top, and then in addition, he's using some kind of uh, coated wire up at the top to basically run between the two different poles to make basically little archways and to grow the uh, grapes up above even his raised beds. I mean, definitely really well thought out here in the backyard. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the things he's actually binding up trellises to get things off the ground because, you know, once again, he's on a limited footprint, you know, maybe uh, 0.28 of an acre. He's got to make the most use of his space he's got a lot of air space up but not a lot of land space so he's growing vertical and i'm really into growing vertically i want to you know share with you guys some ways you guys could do that as well so that you can grow more food for you and your family so here's there's current tomato season uh planting and i like what he's using as his trellising these are just standard um you know the molding for the concrete uh, kind of getting rusted here but they basically support the tomato plants and allow you to put your hands through there to uh, pick them. And this is this kind of stuff is available at any Home Depot or Lowe's store. Just want to basically uh, fold them over and tie them up and make nice big circles. Uh, when you're done with the season, you could uh, actually unfold them and try to store them flat or just keep them rolled up. In winter season, you could actually grow other vining crops up them. Maybe some snow peas or something like that. All right, so this is what I call a trellis. Check it out. This thing has, once again, using the T-post, double talls. I mean, that's a, like at least standing 10 feet tall. He's got the galvanized fencing wire just tied to it. And I mean, this is a serious trellis for growing some high quality food. I mean, if you guys put up small trellises and your plants barely make it to the top, that's because you're not doing something right. Your soil is not built up with the soil biologics, the trace minerals and the biologic fungi and bacteria that are helping bring nutrients into the plants. Plus, if you're not stressing your plants out like you're watering them enough and frequently, they're gonna grow to their full potential and get really tall. That's why he has a nice tall trellis here. So, looks like he was growing some uh, beans here, the long beans he likes to grow, as well as uh, actually uh, some cool things over there, including the yacon that he has uh, actually just staked up, and then over on the other side, some jicama. So let's check out that stuff next. So what we're looking at next are two things. Number one, he's got his yacon. I'm glad they're growing yacon down in here in Houston. If you live in Houston, definitely recommend you guys grow this one as well. Uh, nice, it's called earth apple actually. Nice sweet root. I love it a lot. Actually, you could also use the yacon leaves as a tea. They use it medicinally. And then uh, that's this guy here in this section. Uh, he has them basically just uh, staked up because they have been falling over. And then next door, they got these guys. Like, John, what kind of beans are these? Well, don't eat these beans. Yeah, they're poisonous, man. So the upright growth, like the leaves and the beans of the jicama, uh, toxic. Don't eat them. Don't eat them. Uh, although you can save the seeds, actually, to grow the jicama for next year. Uh, what we're looking at is the jicama root, which is a tuberous root. One of my favorite uh, roots to use. Not totally sweet, but has a nice, crunchy, really mild texture. I like to skin it. Slice it, slice it thin, stick it in some guacamole with the avocados that are you guys just saw. And man, it's super delicious stuff. Uh, the jicama does need a longer season. The yacon should actually have a fairly longer season, but you could get by with a shorter season. I grew uh, jicama and, you know, kind of longer season. And if they don't grow long enough, they're just going to be super small. So you want to be able to start them as early as possible and dig them up as late as possible if you don't live here in Houston that has mild growing conditions year round. 
So it's really fun here. I mean, everything I see, there's always a reason for it. I mean, some gardens I walk into is like, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Here, everything's like methodical, thought out well, and done for a purpose. I mean, here, this is probably just a few pots, a little thing. I mean, maybe this is a bird bath. I don't know exactly what this is for. Maybe it's catching mosquitoes like it is. I mean, there's a purpose to it. I mean, the little area behind me basically has high water use crops that like to be in like a marsh uh, area that stay wet because they got the clay soil here and it's actually, this is all sloped. So the water drains into this area and these plants love the water and use it. And uh, that also helps keep some of the other plants drier because it's actually, uh, you know, in raised beds so that the water drains off so that the roots are not being flooded with water, you know. Too little water is not a good thing, too much water is not a good thing. Plants need just the right amount of water, like you guys need the right amount of food. Not too much, because you might get fat, not too little, because you're wither away, but the right amount. So remember that when watering your crops. Don't give them too much, don't give them too little. Give them the just right amount. So one of the cool things that I've learned here today, walking around uh, with Bob the gardener, uh, is that an old gardener can learn new tricks. And that's part of the thing that I like about him. He's always experimenting. I mean, many of the different, some of the different plants he's grown here are an experiment to see how they're gonna do, how they're gonna perform. He's tried many years for growing blueberries here in Houston unsuccessfully, but now he has a method to the madness and a specific method to do it. You know, blueberries are a great crop. You could probably grow them anywhere in the United States if done properly. So basically he's growing uh, the blueberries here, and this is probably one of the most uh, healthiest blueberry uh, bushes that I've ever seen is totally sprawling out doing really great his method is basically he uh, grows in the peat moss uh, with a little bit of sulfur in there for the acidity uh, some good organic fertilizer with uh, bacteria and fungi and trace minerals the main thing is to keep them watered they got to stay wet so he waters this on an irrigation system automatically so it stays damp I mean something I learned is that the blueberries don't have intricate root systems like trees that'll go out and hunt for water. They need kind of to be in a bog or a place that stays moist so that they could absorb the nutrients from the soil. And uh, they need to stay wet. So that's definitely really cool that he's been able to be successfully growing some blueberries that'll feed him for months. And by the size of this tree, it's gonna feed him a lot of delicious blueberries really soon. So one of the things I wanna share with you guys today is to how to keep you know uh, pests, be it birds or squirrels or whatever, off your fruit so that you get to eat them instead of them. Uh, here's a uh, tangerine tree looks like a lot of the tangerines are still uh, yet to ripen up but looked like this one for some reason got eaten out by bugs or birds or something and you know uh, because he doesn't spray any pesticides and all this kind of stuff what he does do is control it manually or excludes the pests so one of the way he does this is by bird netting which he doesn't actually favor too much depends on the situation because branches could grow through bird netting he likes to use the mosquito netting instead that has a smaller hole size like over a whole tree uh, if your tree doesn't have a whole lot of fruit in it he'll make these little bags here and this little bag here is kind of like out of the screen material for like uh, you know available at home depot for window screens he basically doubles it over and he just uses some staples to make like a little bag or knapsack out of it he'll just take this and put it around the fruit and use a couple wooden clothes pins to close this off and guess what instantly your fruit cannot be eaten by birds and other pests in your garden so that you'll be eating your fruit instead of them. Uh, I guess the other thing I wanna mention is I asked him about stink bugs because that can be an issue for many people that live here in Texas or other areas. And you know, because he does not spray, I'm like, how do you deal with stink bugs if you don't spray nothing, man? He's like, well, he's like, the thing is, at, there's, they're attracted certain times of the year to my uh, you know, long beans and if I go out in the morning early, I'll pick all the stink bugs off the plant and put them in like a solution of water and dish soap and basically drown them. And as long as you control them right when they come out and you get them all right, then they can't reproduce. The problem is if you just see them, you don't do nothing about them, then they mate, have sex and make babies. And then all of a sudden you got an overpopulation. And if you have an overpopulation now, guess what you gotta do? You gotta go out there or hire some neighborhood kids pick them off one at a time, dump them in some soapy water until they're gone. 
and then do that each and every day until you reduce the population. They don't breed and multiply that fast, but if you don't control them, they're gonna, you know, uh, 20 is gonna turn into two, 200, which is gonna turn into 4,000 because every mama makes like 20 babies. What if your mama made 20 babies? That'd be kind of tiring. But anyways, you gotta control them manually and be persistent. I mean, manual control is always the method I recommend. I mean, it's the safest, most effective. You don't have to buy anything, but it will take you some time. So uh, that's definitely a way you can reduce your stink bug population by mainly getting out there each and every day. Once you got them mostly controlled, then maybe go out every other day and you know trellis your beans up so that they're at eye level so that when the stink bugs come on them, you'll be out walking in your garden because I know you're checking your garden every day, right? And you'll see them and you'll stop. Oh, got to deal with the stink bugs today and just pick them off and make it a, a habit, a routine to deal with the bugs as you see them. Because if you don't, they're going to get out of control and eat your stuff instead of you. So I've had a fun time sharing with you guys this permaculture style backyard. I mean, I couldn't show you guys totally everything, but I showed you guys a lot to give you guys some concepts. I mean, basically it's kind of forested with like, you know, fruit trees and shrubs and natives and other understories underneath, you know, as a primary, you know, uh, outside of the yard and the garden as you come into the backyard uh, near the back door actually is all the vegetable beds. I mean, this is done very well. I mean, the last thing I want to show you guys actually right in the back there, you can see it looks like a big tree, but actually that's not a tree. That's like some giant clumping, not spreading, bamboo. Bamboo is a great crop to grow. Some varieties of bamboo can be edible and actually quite tasty. Uh, and even so, just growing the bamboo there, guess what? That's an incredible resource. It grows relatively fast and he has bamboo steaks for free because they could definitely add up. And he's using actually a lot of the bamboo around the garden to uh, support things up when you know when steel is not necessary so many of the different gardens and things that I visit are off limits to just the general public but guess what he is a gardening teacher a permaculture teacher he actually gives tours and will teach you guys how to garden and grow in this fashion I mean if you come to Houston if you live in Houston you want to definitely come here and check it out he also wrote a book so wherever you live you could buy his book his book is specific to Houston, and I think that's the direction gardening needs to take, is there needs to be a certain gardening book for every different area that pretty much lays it out, like how to do it in this climate, because every climate's a little bit different, and you need to make adjustments. You know, a lot of the concepts and things that I'm showing in this video will work totally good in Houston, and may work to some extent in other areas, but why MMV? Your mileage may vary. So next what we're gonna get to do is we're gonna get a chance to talk to Bob and he'll be able to tell you more about his book and also some of the classes and how to get a hold of him, you know, to learn more about what he's doing here and educating people in the local Houston area since the 80s about organic garden. I mean, this is long-term gardener that's been learning new tricks all along. All right, so now we're here with Dr. Bob Randall. Basically, he's basically him and his wife have created all what you guys saw in this video I mean literally he wrote the book you know you can year-round garden in Houston and actually many other places if you live in specifically Houston or the surrounding area you definitely want to buy this book I mean this is literally an encyclopedia of how specifically to garden and besides just the book he also gives local classes so uh, I want to I'm gonna ask him a few questions today so, you know, it's apparent that by walking through his garden, I've learned a lot of things, and just by talking with him, this man is a wealth of knowledge. And, you know, besides just gardening, because I know many of you guys are learning gardening, he really focuses on permaculture and creating systems. I mean, I talked about this earlier in the video, creating systems and a, a absolute method to the madness. There's not just a reason to do this. There's specific and many reasons to, you know, garden and grow things in certain ways. And uh, today I'm going to ask him, like, what's the one most important thing you want to share with my viewers out there as to guard, as with gardening and how they can start incorporating permaculture? The one thing I guess I would say is that every single thing you put in a landscape you can get many uses out of. Many uses. Uh, and every time you add a use to something, you are reducing your work, you're getting more out of it you are saving materials and energy. You can get more uses out of space, more uses out of the relationship between two things, uh, more uses. Uh, some of them uh, can be decorative, but, but you can get all kinds of uses uh, out of them. You can shade walls. Uh, I often give as an example that the tangerines that we grow here. 
The tangerine, uh, of course, produces good fruit and an excellent juice, way better than orange juice in the <laughs> stores. But it does other things. It has fragrant blooms in the springtime. It's an evergreen plant, so it uh, is, looks good in the landscape, but it also can shade a wall. And in this climate, with our 90 degree summers, uh, keeping the shade, keeping the sun off the walls is a big deal. And then uh, they have somewhat thorny trunks and the leaves make things dark. So birds like to nest in them. It's a very safe place for a bird to nest. Uh, the leaves are a, uh, a larval plant for the giant swallowtail butterfly, the largest butterfly in North America. Uh, and, I, and then there are trees. Trees absorb carbon. Uh, trees stop soil erosion. Trees keep water on the property. Trees create mulch. <laughs> Uh, how many uses did I come up with? Wow, uh, you know? at least a half dozen. At least, maybe a dozen, I mean something. And um, I didn't even, t and I was talking a little bit about the relationship between say tree and a house wall, but, uh, and tree and your health, and tree and habitat. Those are connections, relationships, but uh, probably could think of other things like maybe something likes to grow under a citrus tree. Mm. Citrus is a understory plant in nature so it grows with a little bit of shade. It's a fruit tree that will produce with some shade. I mean let me tell you this yeah. guy loves his tangerine <laughs> trees. I mean that's like a lot of the trees here are the tangerines. <laughs> well the ones with the fruit on them right now are mostly tangerines and, and other citrus. Um, come in the spring and we're doing berries but it uh, it it that's the key thing here is not being satisfied with getting only one use mm -hmm. out of something uh, and I would say that permaculture is more than just gardening it's about how you live your life if if I'm going to go um, use the car to go someplace how many uses can I get out of that trip Right, like stopping at multiple uh, yeah. places, visiting yeah. a friend at the same time you're gonna stop by the store on the way back yes. instead of just going to see your friend and coming home. If you're building an organization, if you have school gardens and you have farmers markets, can you somehow connect the schools to the farmers market? Can you get a use out of the connection? Mm. I mean, it's permaculture. Wow, so permaculture is much more about relationships and how, I mean, literally creating interconnected systems. And I want to encourage you guys to think about relationships. You know, when planting beans in your garden, you know, besides just having the food, what well, they're going to also nitrogen fix for you, right? Create a habitat uh, for animals and uh, maybe even pests to congregate on and so you could pick them off. So aside, along with the permaculture concepts, you know, uh, what's one of the favorite plants that you like to grow here that's edible that can, you know, has many uses besides just the, the citrus that you talked about? There are so many. Uh, I'm uh, well. I and my book is year-round gardening, and I, it, you know, it's I. I love the seasons here. Everything keeps changing. Uh, I I love the new things as they come in. So, I have some fantastic pomegranates. Mm. I love pomegranates. The blueberry season is outstanding here. We have wonderful blueberries, blackberries. Uh, peaches that are in season, maybe they're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My favorite fruit is the ripe fruit at the time. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and uh, good heavens, it's uh, <laughs> uh, very, very difficult to... Uh, we have some fantastic uh, summer salads here and uh, when the sweet corn comes in, mm. uh, who can who can, uh, and then the cantaloupe season. I, I mean, <laughs> maybe I like cantaloupes the most, or uh, the pomelos that we're doing right now uh, can run the uh, tangerines. And, and the, the Moro blood oranges, yeah. blood orange juice is better even than tangerine juice. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I, love I don't them. know. What is my favorite? <laughs> oh, I can never can answer that. Let's All right. See. Yes. That's fair. How about uh, some uh, 
good vegetables, like top three vegetables that grow in the climate here that do well, maybe as a perennial, uh -huh. more perennial use? Well, the uh, perennials um, gradually been getting better with perennials. I'm you never was able to grow good uh, globe artichokes until recently. Finally figured out how to do them here. Um, they're not, um, I, I, the ones we have here in the yard, I wouldn't be surprised if there's probably not more than three gardens in the whole area that have them. Wow. Um, because I used to, even my book says they're ridiculously <laughs> hard to grow here. I used to live in a place in California that was a huge marketing center for the thing since I, but uh, I finally learned what to do with the, the artichoke and uh, our collards. Uh, we usually get three, four, five years out mm. of collards if we want, if we just water them in the summer. Watering the summer is a key thing when it's very hot here to make sure they don't dry out. And. Uh, Perennial vegetables, I, those are probably the two key things, but many, many plants um, self-seed, or I mean cilantro self-seeds here. And cilantro is a fantastic plant for, um, it, as an insectiary plant, oh. it attracts beneficial wasps, uh, lots of them, and probably more so than any other plant we wow. grow. Seeds, of course, are coriander and a decent veg, decent spice, but uh, coriander leaves themselves. They're wonderful in our bean tacos that we eat all the time here. Uh, so there's there's a lot of benefit there. Um, cilantro and the southern peas we grow is a fantastic vegetable. Uh, uh, we grow one here called. Um, uh, zipper cream peas, which is a it's a relative of the black eye pea, but a much better flavored one for fresh eating. Wow, I gotta try uh, that one. You should uh, 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 zipper cream peas, and there are many versions of southern peas or cow peas as they're called um, that are really outstanding. Uh, we've grown many kinds, and I like the cream pea the best. Um, and uh, but I. I I have trouble picking out favorites. <laughs> there, are, there are many. Um, ginger grows here for mm, any yeah. edible ginger and, and turmeric, turmeric and yeah. mint. Um, the parsley self seeds, yeah. uh, cutting celery self seeds here. There are several kinds of chili peppers that are uh, perennial here. Um, With the manzanos? Uh, well, I'm sure they would be. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, the the cayenne types, the serranos, uh, and the uh, something we call chili piquin here, which is oh, the, the small ones, the wild, the wild Texas native wild chili. Uh, those will typically last three, four, five, six years, depending wow. on when we get the next cold spell. And uh, uh, so I've seen sometimes a cayenne pepper maybe. Eight feet tall, nine wow, feet tall. Wow, that's amazing. You know, hundreds of chilies on it, you know, more than the whole neighborhood can eat. Probably. You should definitely grow one of those if you live in Houston. Uh, yeah, and uh, and then there's the sweet potato spinach. Yeah, that perennial. was good, yeah. Sweet potato spinach is a uh, relatively hard to find uh, plant. It's a, it's a variety of sweet potato. It's genetically the same as a sweet potato but it has been developed because it will grow in tight clay soils and produce uh, sweet potato leaves that are et quite edible and without needing the kinds of drainage and high quality soil that sweet potatoes require. So in a tight soil place like Houston, uh, they'll grow in any soil we have here as long as it's reasonably drained. So. Wow, definitely a good list of perennials for you guys to research and start growing in Houston. And the cool thing is Bob gives classes. So if you want to learn more from Bob and uh, permaculture and gardening, which I definitely encourage you guys, how can somebody get a hold of the classes and, uh, and your book actually yeah. from you? Well, um, the classes uh, are on the urbanharvest.org website. 
uh, ones I teach and other people that know a lot about this stuff. Um, I, I'm a co-teacher in a 25-hour growing organic vegetables class. Uh, I teach uh, four uh, fruit tree pruning classes in this yard. Wow. <laughs> and uh, then there's the permaculture sequence, which goes on. Um, uh, there's five modules, and uh, one of them it happens three times a year, it repeats, and then the others, one is in the fall, one is in the winter, one is in the spring. So you can... Uh, we do uh, bountiful gardens in this fall. We do growing our green homes and communities in the winter. And we do restoring nature in the spring. So we're rehabbing creeks and things like that. So we cover the whole permaculture international curriculum in about uh, nine months, almost essentially entirely on Sundays, almost all Sunday afternoons. Wow, so a spread out permaculture yeah. class like yeah. every weekend instead of like going for two weeks yeah. straight. That's really smart. And we have a couple, of, we have a two month break around December and a um, short break in mid spring also. So it's not absolutely every Sunday, but nearly so. But you can take it in pieces and uh, we call it permaculture for working people. <laughs> uh, Everybody should know permaculture. <laughs> if you live in Houston, yep. I'd highly recommend it. Yep. And if you don't live in Houston, <laughs> the permaculture uh, classes taught all over the planet yep. Earth. And uh, in the United States, the permaculture activist website, uh, permacultureactivist.net has that. As for where you can find my book, um, my website yearroundgardening.me and that's year round gardening which means there's two R's in it <laughs> but a yearroundgardening.me has got uh, a list of where you can find the book. Awesome. All right Bob well thank you for allowing me to show yes. your garden and uh, talk to you at the end of this video. Yeah. Definitely want to encourage you guys whether you live in Houston or wherever you live start a garden today Get your feet wet. I mean, that's the first step. Pl start with one plant and slowly grow bigger over time until you have your whole place like this. I mean, I'm glad that Bob was able to share this uh, with me today. So I was able to bring this to you. He's a wealth of knowledge. I admire this man a lot. And just in my little visit here today, I learned tons to Im improve my garden. And I hope you guys learned a lot by watching this video as well. So once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, keep on growing.